Welcome to Physician Focus. I'm Dr. Dale McGee. For more than a decade, obesity has been recognized as an epidemic in the United States. According to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, 35% of American adults have obesity and more than 6% have severe obesity. Our youth are affected as well with nearly 13 million children aged 2 to 19 with obesity. Despite great public attention to the condition, rates of obesity have not declined and are increasing. As a result, millions of Americans remain at risk for some of the leading causes of preventable death that stem from obesity, such as heart disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, and certain types of cancer. New research is showing that obesity is more complex than first thought. This edition of Physician Focus will examine some of the misconceptions about obesity, the stigma attached to it, and how ideas can be changed. With me for this discussion are two physicians from the Massachusetts General Hospital Weight Center. Dr. Fatima Cody Stanford and Dr. Scott Bush. Both are board certified in obesity medicine, members of the Massachusetts Medical Society Committee on Nutrition and Physical Activity. Welcome, doctors. Thank Hi, you. Thanks for it's having us. It's great to have you Glad here. Now, why are physicians sitting here talking about obesity? Obesity is more than just a number, isn't it? Sure. It's, uh, it really is, uh, when you think about the number, we think about uh, BMI or body mass index. Mm -hmm. And this is used as a way to estimate somebody's total body fat. But it really is the amount of fat that's in somebody's body that alludes to some risks. And these health risks are really what physicians are concerned about. Okay. And just how common is obesity right now? Right now, probably a little more than a third of the country has obesity. And if we throw in overweight? Up to 70% of the nation. Okay. Yeah. And this has changed. It wasn't always this way. No, so what we've seen is over the last 25 to 30 years, we've seen a, an alarming increase in obesity. So if you look at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention obesity maps, we've seen a significant shift such that several states now have rates of obesity that are greater than 30 or 35 percent. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, we live in Massachusetts where our rates tend to be lower, but d despite the fact that they're low, they're still not as low as we need them to be. Okay. So why do you think this is happening? So our environment has become more obesogenic, and by that I mean we have more things in our environment that predispose us to having obesity. We have lack of sleep, we mm -hmm. have access to more calorically dense food, lesser quality food. Um, there are so many different factors that really play a role in why we have developed obesity over mm -hmm. this alarming rate. Mm -hmm. um, our bodies haven't changed. A lot of people saying, well, you know, from an evolutionary perspective, we haven't evolved in the last 35 years, but our environment has evolved drastically. And with this evolution of our environment, we've had this evolution and or increase in obesity rates. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're moving less, we're eating more. Is that fair? I would say that generally that's fair, but if you look at physical activity and its role in weight and weight regulation, yeah. we recognize that physical activity does a really good job of helping us maintain our weight. Okay. okay? A lot of people go to the gym with this idea that, hey, I'm going to go to the gym, I'm going to join this gym, I'm going to lose all of this weight. But on average, if we look at patients and people over time that go to the gym consistently day in and day out, they maintain their weight, but they get discouraged when they don't lose weight. So mm -hmm. they're like, oh my gosh, I haven't lost any weight. They're expecting to lose these large numbers because maybe they saw an infomercial on TV right. in the midnight hour that says, hey, I do X program and I yeah. lose X amount of weight. But overall, when we look at that patient that did that program or that person that did that program and look at them 10 years later, on average, we're seeing no more than a one or two pound difference in weight. So mm -hmm. the goal is go to the gym to maintain your weight, but that's not what they're selling at the beginning of the year. They say, come join our gym to lose weight. Mm -hmm. They should be saying, come join our gym, maintain your weight, and it won't go up from year to year. And maybe our obesity rates will be less. So it's uh, diet is where it's at, if we're looking to lose weight? Well, I think we have to look at many different components, diet okay. being one of those. All right. uh, we certainly have a plethora of diets that are out there. Yeah, yeah. But it really, I mean, Diet even itself, the word implies that we have to eat a certain way, but we all eat differently. Mm -hmm. And going on a diet, usually people think about uh, excuse me, uh, eating less calories. Mm -hmm. But that's more, that's, uh, eating less calories isn't the only way to lose weight. In fact, people uh, try to lose weight by eating a very little amount of calories and they end up gaining weight uh, several months or a year later. Mm -hmm. So really, the, the term diet uh, really should reflect changing what we eat, the types of food we eat, 
to healthier foods. So talk to me about that. What do you mean by healthier foods? What, what ways can people, besides cutting serving size or looking for lower calorie options, those are the things everybody knows about. Sure. Well, see, I would so say what's those the are other things piece? that we don't want to do specifically. Right. So okay. if, if we're eating lots of fruits, vegetables, yeah. lean proteins, beans, things of that sort, do I really need to eat a smaller portion? Okay. Likely not. If I give you lots of romaine, lettuce, spinach, quinoa, chickpeas, roasted red peppers, you probably could eat a much larger portion of that than you could something that was, you know, highly processed, like a slice of pepperoni pizza, for example. I think that, that's where we've gone wrong. We, okay. we've, we've thought about, instead of eating a cheeseburger, let's eat a half a cheeseburger. Yeah. Really, what we should be doing is eating completely different food. Okay. And it doesn't make a difference about the amount of that food because it really isn't all about calories. And I think that's where we've gone wrong in, in, in telling people how to lose weight. So some foods, even with the, the calorie rating that they, we, you may read on the package, some foods may be more inclined to put weight on you than others. Right, Absolutely. and that's where we have to look at the content of the food, what the food is made of. And, and fortunately, you know, our country's done a very good job of creating f nutrition facts and these labels that are on backs of, of most foods mm -hmm. and give us a little bit of education. But even those uh, nutrition facts are hard to really decipher if you don't know what to look for. Okay. So what would someone look for? What, what do they need to do to change? What, what are the common things that people are doing today that perhaps they can change and, and see better results? Well, well, one thing is that we're not looking at the serving size. I think yeah. people think, okay, I'm drinking a bottle of this or eating a package of that. Yeah. But on the nutrition facts, if you look at the serving size, you know, instead of uh, the amount of sugar in a, in a bottle of... Uh, a bottle of soda, it may be just that there's two servings, so it's actually double the amount of sugar in that in that container. Right, and that's that'll end up uh, putting on calories and, and actually giving a lot of unhealthy ingredients. And so, I'm, but I'm interested in what you're talking to me about with saying different types of food, same calories, mm -hmm. eat this one and you're gonna be better off. Your weight is gonna be easier to control than the other one, even though the calorie counts might be the same. So yeah. I would say less process is better. So if you really look around the grocery store, right, a lot of those things that don't have labels or nutrition facts are your fruits and vegetables, right? If you go down the produce aisle, mm -hmm. there's no nutrition facts available. Mm -hmm. Those are good options. You could probably eat large servings. We could probably fill half this table and be fine and actually not gain weight. We might even find alarming, wow, we lose weight. I ate four oranges or two apples and th three sets of grapes today. That's fabulous. What we're not thinking about is like, hey, well, how can I get more processed food? We wanna reduce the amount of processed food, get more pure or less processed foods, and we can likely eat larger portions of those and still lose weight. And I, th I think it actually has to do with the, the, the content in the food. Mm -hmm. We might, we, I mean, we're still looking and, uh, you know, and, and researches, research, researching, you know, types of food and what is in the content. But there's a lot of things in food that we don't even know about. Mm -hmm. And when you hear things about the, the gut uh, bacteria that lives inside us yeah. that actually could uh, determine our health risk, um, maybe there's an interaction between the food we eat and our and this gut bacteria that lives inside us. That's an interesting thing that we need to talk about a little bit more as well. But I, I think there's another trap that's, that our environment has set for us here, I think. Mm -hmm. and, and that is what I understand is that the average person eats out maybe five times a week. Right. And so, you know, they're not shopping on the produce aisle. They're, they're basically talking into a microphone and, and eating something while they're in traffic. Yeah. In fact, we spend more money going out to restaurants than we do now cooking in, in, inside our own home. Right. And that actually will dictate not only the amount of calories, because we know that eating out in restaurants or takeout, as you were right. alluding to, uh, has increased uh, calories in that food, that we're eating probably poor, you know, not as healthy food, right. poorly quality nutritious food. The quality. So, right. so if you go to your local fast food restaurant, you could drive up and get a salad with grilled chicken and, right. and a, a light balsamic vinaigrette. Yeah. Most people aren't likely choosing that as their option. It's a great option. Several yeah. of the fast food restaurants have pretty good salads. Yeah. But you look at the cost of that salad, maybe that salad would only feed one person, or you could get four cheeseburgers and feed four people. Right. What are most people gonna go for? The four cheeseburgers. Not only does it taste good, I'm feeding four people as opposed to this one salad that's feeding one person. So there are a lot of different factors I think that play a role. Yeah. Right, that is, is one more thing in our environment right. that is, is kind of setting us up for what we're seeing. Absolutely. Sure. But let's talk about this, this uh, 
gut flora mm -hmm. uh, issue. I've read about that, and I'm, I'm just really curious as to uh, where the research is and whether this is at the point where it impacts your clinical advice. Absolutely. So I think, I, you know, I guess I'll start um, when we look at uh, gut bacteria. One of the things that we've seen is that there is a diversity of gut flora or bacteria mm -hmm. that some of it leans towards some people being leaner, and then some people don't have that same diversity and tend to have higher weight or weight mm -hmm. status. So they've done research in mice and rat models and found that if they take some of the good bacteria out of lean mice and put that in mice that have obesity, that they become lean in the same way as those, those mice that were already lean to begin with. So we're trying to explore this now within adult humans. Mm -hmm. If we take the gut microbiota or the gut bacteria mm -hmm. from lean individuals and put that in individuals that have obesity, will we see the same change that we see in mice and rat models? Mm -hmm. And we're anticipating that we will likely see similar changes. So does, is this ready for prime time? Uh, or is this just a, a, an idea that shows promise that, that hasn't worked its way through the uh, Well, there are current research. studies that are going on. So, for example, at our hospital, Massachusetts General Hospital, they do have a study that's currently recruiting, that started yeah. recruitment, um, I think it was in last, like maybe a year ago or so, where they're actually taking the microbiota or the mm -hmm. gut bacteria from lean individuals and giving it to those persons that have obesity. Mm -hmm. The data is, has yet to be released, so we don't know what's going to happen, but we're anticipating that we'll see similar positive results in humans like we do in mice and rat models. Yeah, I mean, I agree. And I think it's, you know, it's not ready for prime time into, in terms of, you know, taking a sample of someone's uh, gut bacteria and saying, okay, these are the diseases you're going to have, you know, throughout your lifetime. Mm -hmm. And we don't have that degree of specificity right now. Mm -hmm. We don't have that degree of preciseness. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think what we should understand is that there is this living bacteria that is in our body that actually can determine our health. We don't know in what form or who has what in their bodies. Mm -hmm. We know that it changes with diet, but it does tell us that what we eat is going to be important and may determine how we, what our health risks are. So if people are taking antibiotics long term, Mm -hmm. Does that affect their weight? Does that affect their gut flora? Do, do they put on weight and lose gut flora? So, so yes to most of those. Uh, we know that bacteria uh, antibiotics can kill the bacteria in our digestive tract. Right. You know, we, want to, we want to kill the bacteria on our skin infection, but it actually kills the bacteria on our digestive tract. That's why some people have some digestive problems after right. taking antibiotics. Right. This shifts. It shifts and changes the bacteria, which can shift and change our own uh, health risk and maybe even our weight. Right. They've done studies mm -hmm. on that that showed the weight changes, but these are the large, uh, large population studies. Yeah, yeah. And then in children, what we've seen is that for children that are exposed early to antibiotics, they have changes that happen early enough for, in life that they develop obesity earlier and then more severe obesity as they become adults. One of the viruses that, for example, people also have also looked at is adenovirus 36 and its role in weight and weight regulation in the pediatric population. Some people that get that um, virus early on in life may have a higher likelihood of having obesity with pretty rapid onset obesity as they get into um, adolescence and mm -hmm. young adulthood. So I've heard that there are points in a person's life when as they gain weight they add fat cells and there are other times when as they gain weight they simply blow up their fat cells. Uh, and uh, you know when does that happen? How does that affect a person's ability to lose weight? I think that's a very very important to understand that when we're young, we were born with a certain number, many fat cells in our body, which is important. We need to store uh, fat for energy. Mm -hmm. um, and, this, and these fat cells can accumulate in our childhood. However, when we become adults, we don't gain any more fat cells. The fat cells, as you were saying, mm -hmm. increase in size or decrease in size. And that's what we're seeing when we see somebody who loses or gains weight. Mm -hmm. We don't add many other cells. So prevention in, the, in, the ch in, the, in children is very important for that specific reason. We're setting them up to make it more difficult for them to lose weight right. in adulthood. And that's, and that's what studies show. If, you, if you're overweight or, or have obesity as a child, you're more likely to have as an adult. Okay. And um, so what other medications 
uh, do we need to talk about with regard to obesity? Are there any other medications that So now we're talking about medications that cause weight yeah. gain, because there are a lot of medicines. So, you know, I guess we'll kind of volley off of each other, but several medications that are prescribed to either children, adolescents, or adults can cause weight gain. And what we really need to do is look at the medical, the medication list for patients mm -hmm. and see, hey, are you on this drug that causes weight gain? Can mm -hmm. it be removed? But let's look at some of them. Several of the antipsychotic medications, those medications can cause weight gain. Um, many of the antidepressants can cause weight mm -hmm. gain. Some of the hypertension medications or medications used to treat blood pressure can cause weight gain. Insulin prednisone, several different medications that are widely used for yeah. con conditions can often be changed or modified to put on drugs that cause less like or have a lesser likelihood of causing weight gain. Okay. Yeah. Right. And we have to also understand that that may happen in one person and may not happen in another person. Mm -hmm. um, but it, as Dr. Uh, Stanford said, it's really important to take a look at what medications you're on. And if you want to, you know, if you're interested in losing weight, mm -hmm. maybe these medications are uh, blocking your efforts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the person goes to the doctor, they hear that they're, they're overweight. Mm -hmm. uh, the doctor advises them to diet and off they go. What, you know, when they walk out of the office with that piece of information, what's sort of the first wave of uh, things that they should think of if they're taking this advice seriously and want to be successful? What's the well, first, first thing I, they do? I would change what the doctor said. So the doctor said to go and change their diet. It presumes that patients that have overweight or obesity have a diet that's poor. Mm -hmm. When we talk to patients that have overweight and obesity, they may actually have a diet that is pretty virtuous mm -hmm. or superior to someone that's leaner. Mm -hmm. And so we first need to take stock in what are they really eating. Maybe they're okay. doing really well in that realm and maybe that's not where my focus needs to be at all. Mm -hmm. And so I would challenge the doctor to maybe take a broader view to see okay. what is causing them. Maybe everyone in their family has had obesity and so that's the cards they were dealt. We can't pick our parents. Mm -hmm. Don't tell my parents, I love my parents, my parents are adorable. But I can't pick who they are. Mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't predict, I can't say, hey, I want a family history or a tree that says I have obesity versus not because I come and this is what the cards that I'm dealt. So I would, I would kind of challenge that doctor to mm -hmm. take a, a deeper dive. Um, so is there a for, sort of a simple first wave mm -hmm. with regard to a person analyzing their, their diet and mm -hmm. saying, okay, well, you know, here it is. That's certainly, we can do that. Uh, we can figure out what we're eating. I and mean, there's, we could write it down on a piece of paper. We could, now there's uh, apps for phones that can track what we eat. We have to type it in, but it tells us all the nutrition facts. Um, but if we take a closer look at what we eat, maybe there are things that uh, are worse for us and maybe causing our weight gain. We should take a look at our, our physical activity. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, it may be just more than that. It, some people who, have, who sleep less at night, they're more prone to uh, gaining weight. Other people who have more stress in their lives, and they may gain weight. So there's, uh, there are other factors that are taking in, but we can cer certainly do a self-assessment in the, in the first wave of trying to figure this out ourselves. It sounds like, just listening to you, it, it sounds like asking oneself, how often do I eat out? You know, do I, what do I eat when I eat out? That's kind of an easy one because you know, you know what you tend to and order. what do I eat in general? You know, you know and, and, and go towards those sorts of things. How often how do often? I eat? Okay. How's my sleep? How many okay. hours? Maybe I'm not getting that much sleep. So or maybe I'm getting a things. lot of sleep, but the quality is poor. Let's All say right, I'm getting right. 10 hours of sleep, but I wake up 10 times. Yeah. I would rather a person get six hours and have continuous high quality sleep and someone to sleep for 10 hours and wake up 10 times mm -hmm. and have take 30 minutes to fall back asleep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the quality and duration of sleep are important. Okay. Taking, you know, look at, like you said, stress levels. Mm -hmm. If we can do things to reduce our stress, often that will help our bodies normalize weight in ways that we aren't able to do tangibly. I can't d directly affect someone's stress as a physician, but maybe I could say, oh, maybe you should remove this activity that's inducing a lot of stress. There are life stressors that often we are unable as a physician to, to tackle. And it may be that they're, they're, they just recently lost a loved one. Mm -hmm. I can't change the stress associated with that. But over time, maybe that stress will normalize and we will see weights returns to, to its a more normal status. Talk to me a little more about stress and weight gain. 
Well, think about this. We, we know that our body is very good at controlling our weight or mm -hmm. our, our body fat, because fat is, is needed for energy. Mm -hmm. Um, much like uh, our body needs uh, blood mm -hmm. in our body. And if we were to give a, donate a, a pint of blood uh, to the local Red Cross, our body would figure that out and would try to restore that blood volume. Mm -hmm. well, the, same way, the same thing happens when we try to lose weight. We lose weight and, uh, and our body realizes that. And then uh, we end up gain, regaining some weight. But it really is the brain that's at the centerpiece of our, the control of our body weight. So when you stress this brain, mm -hmm. you're stressing a lot of the pathways that are involved in controlling our weight. Mm -hmm. And that can lead to weight gain mm -hmm. or weight loss. Some people lose a lot of weight when, it varies. You know, yeah, with stress. Yeah. So that's another dimension for somebody to think about Absolutely. when their weight is not. Yeah. Uh, I think Dr. Sanford made a very good point. Is there's the stress things, there's things in our life that are stressful that we that are part of our lives. Mm -hmm. But then there are the other things that we could actually make a change. And it's that change that may be very helpful in losing weight in the end. So the other piece is uh, in the treatment of obesity, we talk about analyzing your diet, your environment, uh, your stress levels, those sorts of things. There are treatments that get used when the usual things don't work. Absolutely. What sort of treatments uh, are available right now that are uh, effective? Well, I, I think we, we, we have to understand that everybody's different. So mm -hmm. one treatment may work for your neighbor, but it may not work for you, mm -hmm. whether that's a diet plan, an exercise plan. Um, but you're right, when things are, seem to be controlled, diet, exercise, sleeping well, yet someone still wants to lose weight, sometimes we use medications. Mm -hmm. Medications that may interact with our brain or our digestive tract that are very helpful in, in helping people lose weight. Mm -hmm. Are they short-term or long-term medications? Are these things that you take? So when we're, so he just made some very important points. When we look at the fact that these medications work on how the brain sees weight mm -hmm. or work on how the digestive tra um, tract sees weight, if we put the medication on board, a person responds, mm -hmm. as soon as we remove that medication, mm -hmm. that system goes unregulated and their weight will return back to where it was prior to the use of medication. So it's very much like when we use antihypertensive to treat sure. hypertension. Some people need one drug, some people need three drugs. We don't know until we try, and often we have to try different combinations to get the right combination for that individual. Mm -hmm. With medications, we often have to do the same thing. But if we were to remove those medications, very much like if you were to remove right. those high blood pressure medicines, that person's blood pressure will go back up their weight will return back to a, the same status. How long have these meds been in use? So, for example, one of the common drugs, fentramine, has been around since 1959. Mm -hmm. So a few years, you know, a few years older than myself, actually. Okay. Um, so these drugs, have, many of them have been around for a long time. A lot of them were used for other issues, mm -hmm. like epilepsy or migraine headaches or mm -hmm. other reasons, diabetes. And we found, wait a minute, these medications are also effective tools to treat weight. And so they have now become, uh, many of these drugs are now FDA approved, many of them in combination with other drugs to be used long term okay. for weight loss. Okay. And so the FDA approval for many of these drugs is for long term use. Some of them are still unfortunately only denoted for short term use, um, even if we use them long term for, for weight regulation. So I, I think we're, we're getting to the end of our time, okay. but I think there's one important topic we, we ought to at least touch on briefly, and that is the fact that despite their best efforts, uh, many patients may not be able to effectively lose a lot of weight, and, and yet they are subjected by society, by the medical system, by everyone with certain stigmas. What are your thoughts on that, and, and how, how should that be addressed? Well, I, I think, first of all, we should become more aware of this, uh, mm -hmm. that it, it does exist, whether we're physicians, whether we're, uh, we're an employer, whether we're a teacher. Uh, you know, weight stigma or discrimination against those based on their weight exists in many different areas. Mm -hmm. And it actually can, people are bullied because of their weight. And it's, this, it's this misconception that obesity is a, a lifestyle problem, a characteristical flaw 
uh, and that's why they're overweight. And, and people have these beliefs and they're very judgmental. And mm -hmm. it's this judgment that really can impair both someone's health conditions and their overall Raise their stress, uh, level stress. Level situation yeah. make it worse. So I have a great example of a patient of mine who um, came in with 150 pounds in excess, so mm -hmm. that carried um, basically a person in excess, went and got, tried to get hired at a local retailer. Um, was immediately turned down from this job, mm -hmm. then came and worked with me at the weight center. We did some behavioral work, then some medication. She eventually went to weight loss surgery, lost 160 pounds, went back to the same employer, the same hiring manager, and was hired on the spot. Mm -hmm. So here we have a patient who has not, it's this exact same patient, exact same qualifications, yet she's 160 pounds lighter, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, she's a, we're able to hire her on the spot two and a half years later. If that's not weight discrimination or weight yeah. bias, I don't know what is. Yeah. Right. I actually call that term hidden uh, weight discrimination mm -hmm. because it's hidden from plain sight. Mm -hmm. A person who actually is discriminatory might not even realize it, mm -hmm. but they're, they're letting the image of that person, just like color happens, mm -hmm. this person's image is giving a certain judgment in that person, mm -hmm. and they're judging this person unfairly. And yeah. it's this unfairness that really is what we're trying to challenge. And I think, you know, what we've talked about so far is, is that there's so much that goes into this. I mean, it's the environment for, for sure. It also has to do with a certain amount of the individual characteristics of a person's metabolism, and, as well as the usual things regarding uh, diet and the like. So we've covered a lot today, and um, I just want to be sure to thank you, uh, uh, Scott and Fatima, for uh, speaking with us and being part of this program. And for more information on obesity, I'd like you to visit our homepage at physicianfocus.org. I am Dr. Dale McGee. Thank you for watching. I'm Dr. Dennis Dimitri. I'm Dr. Monica Burrell. Prescription drugs are valuable medicines and when taken under a doctor's supervision provide effective pain relief for many conditions. But the abuse of these powerful drugs has become a serious public health problem in Massachusetts and across the country, resulting in the needless deaths of thousands of people. If you are prescribed opioids or pain medication, talk with your doctor about the risks and benefits of the medicines and explore different ways to treat your pain. The safe use of prescription drugs comes when physicians and patients work together to promote healing and good health. Medicines cure, heal, and relieve pain. Use them carefully, store them securely, and dispose of them properly when no longer needed. What you do can make a difference. For more information, visit the websites of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health or the Massachusetts Medical Society. I'm Dr. Frank McMillan. And I'm Dr. Raj Devarajan. Colorectal cancer is the second leading cause of cancer-related death in the United States, claiming more than 50,000 lives each year. The cancer occurs in the colon and rectum, parts of the large intestine, and is caused by growths called polyps that can turn into cancer. Screening for colorectal cancer saves lives, but 23 million American adults, about one in three, don't get screened as recommended. Colorectal cancer affects men and women, and the, high, and the risk rises with age and a family history of the disease. If you're over 50 or have a family history of the disease, early screening is recommended. Screening can reduce the risk of colon colorectal cancer by up to 90% by finding and removing the growths before they turn into cancer. For more information on colorectal cancer and the different screening tests available, visit the American College of Gastroenterology.